the marinade. There's no O in marinade. Let's try it one more time. Ready? One, <laughs> two, three. <laughs> the marinade. <laughs> marrow. Marrow. Marinade. Bone, bone marinade. The marinade. The marinade. With Jason Earl. Preach said I need to be saved. Better pray before they put me in the grave. If I want to enter in, I've got to be born again. I just look them in the eyes. Welcome to the Marinade, a free flowing conversation about the creative process with creative people. Each episode, we welcome musicians, actors, comedians, authors, visual artists, filmmakers, anyone who creates art to talk about how and why we make stuff. This is episode 152, and our guest is Zach Russell. Zach is a singer and songwriter from Knoxville, Tennessee, whose debut full-length record, Where the Flowers Meet the Dew, will be released on Friday, December 1st, 2023. Where the Flowers Meet the Dew follows his debut EP, The Creek, which I highly recommend as well, y'all. They're both outstanding, and I can't say enough about this record. We went deep in this one about religion, philosophy, and music, but we also had a lot of fun, and I can't overstate how much I needed this chat. Everyone, it's my great pleasure to bring you my conversation with Zach Russell. Baby, when I die, we'll be born again and 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 again. Have you got me? Yeah, cool. and you look you look great and you sound great. Oh, thanks. <laughs> All right, let's try this again. Damn it, Jason. Um, so for folks listening, I will do my best to make this seamless. But in case I reference something that you did not hear on record, it is because we were on a different platform and I fucked it up. Um, <laughs> I realized what I did though. I joined as a guest instead of the host. So we were just uh, both guests in there, I think was the issue. But anyway, this will work great. And um, I appreciate your flexibility. So oh, no worries. what I was saying earlier was that, uh, that your record's just incredible where the flowers meet the dew. I'm, I'm just absolutely crazy about it. And um, I want to, I want to ask you again, because I think you gave us some really, really good stuff there about the, the themes of, religion and existence and uh just the, this, these really heavy heady things that you handle so beautifully on the record and you know a record like this is really helpful for people like me who grew up in the baptist church um who deal with the the legacy of that the trauma of that um and who are deeply scarred by it, frankly. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you were able to take the, that heaviness and those difficult things and put them into such beautiful words? Well, um, do you want me to kind of sum up what I was saying on the last one? Or is that is that lost? Yeah, that would be great if, if you could. Cool. Cause, uh, yeah, because yeah, I, no I, I don't... I think you 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 said it so beautifully. Yeah, no worries. I just wanted to uh, make sure I was playing it right there. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, I was I was just saying like that I was glad that it uh, comes across as as uh, as something that can be helpful for people as they're dealing with the same things that I dealt with. Uh, because a big part of this record was about reclamation. And uh, like, for instance, it said the 
act of riding born again was me taking control of this language that had caused me a lot of grief and trauma in my upbringing and uh, reclaiming that language as, you know, I am, I am born again. Um, but constantly via, you know, moments that touch me and things that I read and people that I meet. And in another sense, via, you know, my mass, my meat suit, you know, uh, just the act of me existing is the act of things that were once other things that are now born again in me. And in the same vein, I will one day go on and lay all this down and uh, my stuff hopefully becomes something else and is born again then as well. Well, that particular song is so powerful and it is a wild ride, which made me uh, specifically, I mean, so lyrically for sure, but also sonically. And then I think that wild ride that I'm referring to comes through in a lot of the record. Um, can you talk about those choices sonically and how you came to, to that place with the record? Yeah, well, going in, I had sent my engineer some reference stuff and said, you know, I want to do it all on like old ribbon microphones um, or not old, but ribbon microphones, it's just a, this capture sound in a different way than, I mean, you work with audio. You probably know a little bit about it. Um, I do, but for not, not a ton. So for folks listening, yeah. can you kind of explain what that is and how it's different? Well, the, I mean, I don't know a ton about it either myself, <laughs> but the base, I, from my understanding, you know, a lot of these older microphones, they have a ribbon in there, like a very fragile little ribbon that vibrates and via sound and things being passed over it. And then it captures captures it that way as opposed to a lot of our more modern microphones that I believe are um, some sort of electromagnetic based something. And yeah, I just been, I just listened to a lot of old stuff and uh, the trends today seem to be making these really clean, clear records, which I guess is what, uh, people were always working towards in the past, you know, like they want a cleaner, shinier, brighter recordings. Um, but yeah, I just always enjoyed the old stuff, the warm sounds that, you know, felt like it was coming from a different dimension uh, that you could lose yourself in a little bit easier. And so I told the engineer, I wanted to do all ribbon microphones and he just happened to have one of the country's like largest collection of the specific brand of microphone like in his possession because oh. he had been working on another job that they used him and the guy told him that he could just hang on to him as long as he wanted. And, um, wow, that's so awesome. Yeah, it just so it was just a it was a moment of uh, meant to be, I suppose. And so yeah, from even before we were going in, you know, like I was very, had a very clear vision of what I wanted it to sound like. And then from there, I picked, you know, picked my band members accordingly that, you know, brought something in interesting to the table. And most of what you hear on the record is live. It's what we recorded in the studio that day. There's only, only a handful of songs that we redid vocals for, and then we added keys on a couple, but that's it. The rest of it is just live in the studio and something that I think is very important to the recording process and making a cool record is, you know, allowing a little bit of magic to happen through collaboration 
at the moment of capture that you really can't, you just can't get multi-track recording. You know, you have to, if you do have a good idea, like, Oh, what are you supposed to do? Bring, bring the drummer back in for five Mm. more days, you know, Mm. but as opposed to, you know, in there, in the studio, you you know, I've got Kyle crown over the, the great producer and a, one of my best friends for a long time and is someone that I trust to give some direction and pointers in the room. And then you just step in the booth and you just take it down. You know, you mentioned Kyle crown crown over, and I wanted to ask you about your relationship with Kyle and your relationship with the deem, the artist. There seems to be a group of y'all that are, that making music together right now that doesn't sound like anybody else that is really thoughtful is really cool is not afraid to take risks and i mean the three of you is what jumped out to me you know right off the bat like kyle producing this record and being so involved with adeem's records and then their brilliant white trash revelry uh from last year is that are you kind of like can you speak on that relationship and sort of creatively and personally and how sort of y'all are able to, to, to kind of, it feels like you're, you got like a special moment right now going. Yeah. Well, I think, well, I've known Kyle for, we first met at MTSU when we were both starting school there. And, you know, we just kind of been friends with, dreams that were um that provided a little friendly competition to kind of push forward like i was always you know kyle kyle's gonna put out a great record here before sometime soon i don't a lot of people don't know that kyle's a really gifted writer and singer Mm. um so a lot of a lot of my work ethic and a lot of the time i've spent was hearing kyle play and being like fuck I'm not that good, <laughs> you, know, you know, having to, having to work to get there and meeting a Dean was kind of the same, you know, like seeing them in a scene I was familiar with, like Knoxville and being like, well, shit, I thought I was the best artist in Knoxville. <laughs> you know, I'm, yeah. Where did this person come from? I'm, so it was like another thing, like, oh, you got to step your game up, you know, and I admire, I admire both those people uh, very greatly and really trust their judgment and artistic eye. And and I think for me and Adeem and Kyle, uh, we've all been doing it a very long time, you know, so you're kind of witnessing things getting to a point to a tipping point or something I think like and we just we've been around so long and tried to play the game at least me and Kyle like we were first trying to be you know like music row riders and then Mm -hmm. uh music just got worse and worse coming out of there so you know like and we were like well it's gonna take 10 years to make it in that scene too you know, so why not just do things your own way? And then you get to a certain point and it's like, well, all of my, you know, my gut feelings and my choices and tastes have gotten me to this point, you know, so it's almost like a a doubling down on trusting yourself. It's like, oh, this works. Like, well, I'm not going to start like making something for someone else now or or if something makes me feel excited, you know, I got to trust that. Man, and that Kyle's is... a good sanding board too, um, to, you know, to offer. It's like, yeah, I get what you're saying, but does it maybe come across this way? And then you can kind of go back and forth on, you know, whether something's coming across or not. That's such good stuff. Um, is that healthy competition, does that show up in the studio when Kyle's producing your record? Is there any, like, I don't know. Is there any sort of competitive spirit about that relationship? 
Uh, not as much, you know, because uh, when we're in the studio, it's usually uh, like just it's just a great time. You know, it's just so fun. Like you, you know, you typically work at 10 to five or something, just getting as much done as you can. And, and if everybody comes in, you know, knowing the changes and everything, you can kind of just have fun. Like even, you know, the guitar player, Jake, like he's told me like three times since then, he's like, man, that was the most fun studio session I've ever had. Like it was just so easy it's like, yeah, and uh, so Kyle's I – mean, I'm just trying to nail it because I'm trying – like, my ego is, like, I want the energy of this happening now to be captured. So I'm just trying to, like, get something worth keeping on my end when I'm in there. But, yeah, Kyle's just a, a great teammate in that setting, more or less you know, just supporting and, you know, giving direction so I can just focus on performing and what I'm feeling and finding myself drawn towards. Yeah. Man. Well, you did nail it. And um, I'm really excited for folks to, to hear this record. How did you, I, so you brought up something that I think is, really helpful for folks who are who make stuff and who are interested in making stuff which is the idea that like you know now uh, a dean for example is getting their flowers getting the respect that um that they deserve and going out on tour with jason isbel and all these kinds of things um but like you said you've all been doing it for a long time and it takes a long time to get to that point what kept you going you're you're on you're like writing on music row you're realizing the music's getting shittier and shittier coming out of there you're realizing you would have to put in all this like you know all this time just to get to a certain place like what kept you pushing through it to ultimately lead to this point man i guess just you know i at this point, you know, now I'm finding this really strong fire in me to like get things done and push the stones. Like I'm going to, I'm this close. I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm sorry, but, but it, let, let me, they, my dogs will not shut up. I don't, can you hear them? Oh, you, no, I can't. Oh, you can't. Oh, okay. I can't hear them at all. If, no. if, if they're not coming through, then cool. Okay. No, I don't hear them at all. Um, uh, but at that point, it was really just, I guess, more than anything, like just the urge to create. And I've just always had a um, good friend in the guitar, you know, just mm. ever since I was a kid, you know, like no matter what, like uh, I could go play guitar, like guitar couldn't flake on me or break my heart or nothing you know so it was i've I've always just kept my head down playing and practicing you know it was a so that's i think that's what carried me through or i wasn't as much of like i'm gonna i I obviously wanted to make something of myself but it was so far away and i couldn't see what i was even doing that uh, it was just just really just the love of playing that kept me in it Oh, that's awesome. I really, I've said this before, but I think it's been a while since I've said it on the show. I really wish I play guitar, but quite poorly. And I, I never (laughs) really like dedicated myself to it. I just, you know, I'll pick it up and for a month I'll play every day and then I'll just set it aside and I'll forget about it. Or I won't have a, you know, I don't want to interrupt anybody else in the house and that, you know, so like put it down and, um, and growing up, I always wanted to play. And I just didn't like commit to saving up my summer job money to buying one until I was like eight, 17, I guess, 17 or 18. So I didn't pick it up till I was 17 or 18. And, and I played a lot in my twenties and, and then I just sort of like let it go for a while. And 
I, I looking back, I wish I would have developed that habit early because the other thing about it, it's not going to flake on you. Like you said, it's always going to be there, but also you can do it for pretty much your whole life. You know, yeah. like you, I, I, I spent so much time focusing on sports, which was great. And it gave me a lot and I love it, but I really wish I would have spent equal time playing guitar because it doesn't go anywhere. You know, you, you can have, like you said, it's always there. It's steady. It's a steady friend and you can always, yeah. and it gives so much too, man. It's just, you know, picking, I never pick up the guitar and regret it. <laughs> no, it's a, uh, it's a, it, yeah, it's a great thing to have. And it really is just, you know, we, I talk uh, to people often and they'll be like, man, I wish I could play like that. I'm like, this is, it's not something that just happened. You know, it's like, I, yeah, I practice for three, four hours every single day. That's how it, you know, it's, so it's like a lot of times you have people, not you, you're, uh, you seem very aware, uh, but the, you know, people imply like, oh, I could, I just, didn't get any talent like this guy just got talent it's like no it's just hard work like anything else and and also to that you know it's never too late you can always pick it up and dig into it that's such a great reminder that is such a great reminder i'm glad i'm gonna play tonight uh it's such a great <laughs> reminder like you know because there's certain things like you can plateau you know if you if you're not picking it up every day and you're not also making an effort to learn new things, you know, like yeah. I, I've been playing the same eight chords, you know, really five of them decently well for <laughs> 30 years. <laughs> you yeah. know? It's like, all right, buddy, maybe, maybe learn a new, a new trick, um, mm -hmm. which you could, you can do it. You know, old dog can learn those new tricks when it comes to guitar specifically. Um, a few of the songs on here absolutely wreck me. Um, die to myself really wrecks me. Um, and I'm curious about write writing process for you. Um, like you sit down with the guitar every day. Are you sitting down to write every day? What does the process look like? Uh, I was, I was a little more diligent. Uh, when I was younger about sitting down and writing like, oh, if you start something and it sucks, you know, just finish it out, just pound it out, you know, develop your craft. And I think that was, that was definitely necessary um, for, a, for building my skills to the point that they're at now. But uh, now I'm more just, I mean, I don't ever really sit down to write unless I'm feeling inspired by something already, you mm -hmm. know, or, you know, just sometimes thoughts come to me and when I'm going to go write, if I'm going to write something, you know, once I have a thought, you know, I have to be able to think, is mm -hmm. this big enough to build a world in and does it have enough to the story to develop over, uh, two verses and a bridge, you know? Mm. Uh, and if it, if I can see in my head, like where that's going, you know, I'm like, I, I sit down and it's, you know, it's half done already. So, but that's, but that's a, um, a privilege I allow myself now that I've written hundreds of crappy songs, you know? Mm that I can allow myself that and I'm not, you know, and I, and I just, and sometimes it comes in waves, you know, I'll write three songs in a week and then I won't even think about writing another song for two months sometimes, you know, it's just, but also right now I've been in album prep mode. So I've not really had a lot of spare, uh, spare brain space for it anyway. Yeah, I feel like that's something that sometimes we forget about the making a making a life in music is that like, you know, people forget all of the other stuff, you know, the the podcasts like this and the you know, the mm -hmm. interviews and like 
all the other stuff that you got to do. Um, oh yeah. You know, like that stuff is time consuming and draining. I'm sitting here asking you to talk about existence, you know? <laughs> oh, I like talking about existence. <laughs> well, let's, let's dive a little deeper into it. Like where, <laughs> where are you kind of on the whole cosmic thing now? Like, where are you on the sort of why we're here? What happens after we die? That sort of thing. I know I just threw a blanket on like a bunch of different heavy. Topics. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I guess the simple answer to where I am right now would be a place of, I don't know uh, yeah. about Same. a lot of the things, um, but a comfortable, I don't know, you know, I, I think a lot about meaning, you know, like, and when I was in my early twenties, early mid, well, all my twenties, I guess I, I carried around a lot of existential dread and conundrum with me everywhere. Like, Oh, no, you know, you watch you, you start seeing your grandparents die and you're just like, Oh, what's the fucking point? And it is. Yeah. And so I was in that for a long time. And, um, you know, there's really the stilliest thing that I, uh, kind of flipped a light switch on in my head is this, um, Bob Dylan documentary or something. And I've heard this said before, but for some reason, the way he put it, uh, really made it sink in it was basically just like you know yeah it's meaningless so go out there and make it whatever you want mm. um and so and i took that to mean you know like you have to manufacture your own meaning so meaning is with my weekly dinners with my parents and weekly date night with my wife and we take the dogs out right before sunset every evening you know and throw tennis balls around with them and you know like i don't wait for meaning to come to me any longer you know it's like i make it or i go find it um and yeah and i about what happens after we die? Shoot. I don't know. Ain't none of us ever gone and lived to tell about it. You know? <laughs> right. Um, but, you know, it's, maybe it's, maybe there's some parallel dimension where it happens for eternity. or uh, I don't know. Uh, well, I do... Yeah, go ahead. Well, no, no, no. Finish that thought, please. That this has all been good. What were you gonna say? Well, I was just gonna. I, it was kind of a a segue into uh, recent philosophies I've been finding myself diving into. Um, are you familiar with Taoism at all? Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I've. I could I almost call myself a Taoist nowadays. It's kind of okay. And, and in my understanding of it, it almost feels like the lazy man's Buddhism, you know? <laughs> yeah. You don't have to meditate or eat rice or anything. All you do is just not cast judgment on things, like not label. It's basically non-duality in a way, you know, like mm. there's like labeling something good automatically makes other things bad, you know, like you know, like we think of vultures and maggots, uh, you know, since they're harbingers of death, you know, we think of them as ugly or bad, but really they serve a much needed purpose in this whole thing of it all. You know, like you can't, what would, what would things be like without maggots and vultures to eat and break down the dead things it would just be carcasses everywhere right. you know like and so that's kind of where i try and operate from is not you know withholding judgment you know maybe 
I still have judgments, but I try and, you know, let them, you know, look at them and uh, kind of let them go and just tell myself, you know, everything, everything belongs here. You know, it's not separate and everything that's popped up is likely a uh, response towards an opposing force to it, you know, and, and just, and just try and try and be happy, you know, like more than anything. Man, that's beautiful. And I can relate to a lot of what you said. Um, I think, you know, I spent, I minored in philosophy in college and then I spent a whole lot of my twenties, pretty much my whole twenties, just completely lost in existential questions and anxieties about my existence. I mean, I still, I don't want to, people listening know that I, <laughs> I still deal with that shit. <laughs> yeah, um, me too. Yeah. <laughs> But I, I'm trying to get to a place where I'm in this, but this does happen when I meditate and it does happen when I'm practicing yoga regularly and I'm not drinking is that <laughs> I am able to be more present. You know, I'm yeah. able to be in the moment more and not worrying about what could happen or, or what might happen. It sounds like you've gotten to a place. We talked earlier off mic about like the, the fact that growing up in the church nine or 10 years old being told, Hey, you're going to either live in paradise forever, or you're going to burn in hell forever, depending on a few different things and how as a nine or 10 year old, how intense that is and how like, yeah, you know, we both experienced intense anxiety over it. And I still definitely feel it. It sounds like maybe you've gotten to a place where you don't feel those anxieties anymore. Well, I'm pretty on top of it right now. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Just like that. I think that's a, uh, that's going to be anxiety and all that is going to have troops at the wall, you know, forever. Right. Yeah. I think I just get better at defending them and filling my life with things that matter to me and make me feel good and present and, like you, not drinking was a uh, quitting drinking was a huge one mm. for that as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it makes all the difference in the world for me. You know, if I'm, if I'm not drinking, um, I have been drinking lately and like, I can just, I mean, I can feel the difference, you know, in terms of my anxiety, like I need to get, I need to take a break at the very least. Um, cause it does make such a huge difference in how anxious I am. I'm, I'm curious about something you said earlier that I want to kind of start to wrap things up on. And that is you were talking about listening to a lot of older music and off mic, you even said that you don't really listen to anything post like 1980. And it, yeah. There's, I, I'm curious about that. Like, there's so much great stuff right now, right? <laughs> and there's some people I was, yeah. Okay. All right. So, who are those people? Who are those sort of more modern artists that you listen to? Man, don't forget I, any of your friends. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, Charlie Crockett. Like, <laughs> I love his whole thing. Um, Let's see. Who, I, Is that maybe because uh, his music sounds pre-1980? <laughs> probably. <laughs> um, and obviously, you know, I have, uh, I have friends that make great music that I think that I really respect. And, you know, even if I'm just because I'm, I don't really listen to anything. Don't mean, doesn't mean I think other things are bad. Just to like, how Dallas that's just, you. <laughs> that's just, I mean, like, obviously, like, I have huge respect for, you know, Drayton Farley and Nolan Taylor, mm -hmm. two guys I just got done doing some shows with that are absolutely killer. Um, and, you know, I used to work for Tyler Childers and he, you know, goes without saying how incredible that guy is um, right and who doesn't love sturgill simpson you know i listened to meta modern through the other day 
Um, you're, you're, what a, I, I'm sure you've gotten this, but your voice reminds me of his. Yeah, I have gotten that. Uh, I, I just, I tend to think of myself as more of a crooner really than like mm-hmm. a Sturgill Simpson, more along the lines of like a Willie Nelson or, or Sinatra well, I, or something, but I get that too. Yeah. I, but I think there's, that's the difference, but like what I'm saying, I think is that sonically it does not necessarily that you sing yeah. the same way. You know what I mean? Gotcha. Yeah. Um, you, I, I totally forgot about to ask you about being on tour with Tyler. What was that experience like? Oh, it was great. Um, uh, it was a hard job. Um, mm selling t-shirts you know it's like you're you're like the first one out working and you're the last one on the bus and you're lifting heavy boxes and inventorying everything and setting up a store and tearing it down every single night and then running the store for five hours you know it was it was a it was a good thing for the place i was in uh, then when I was just kind of trying to figure out, just wanted to just wanted to travel and do something interesting, and uh, but the crew was great, and I will consider all the all those guys good friends, and um, yeah, it was it was pretty wild to see. You know, like I started with Tyler in like 2018, mm. and was basically with him through, I guess, the summer of last year so i saw um i saw the a good chunk of the rise of tyler childers you know and we started when i first started we there was some 300 400 person rooms on the tour and and now he's selling fifteen thousand tickets at um whatever the Lexington arena is that they're at Rupp. Um, and, and if you can't get them, if you want them, you know, like, yeah, the people fighting over those 15,000 tickets. I, so I, re- I remember when you, you would must've been on this tour because I remember when he came to Orlando and he played the Plaza live. And, uh, I remember waiting to get tickets and I don't know what capacity at the plaza is, but it's a you know mid-sized rock club. Um, and I remember waiting on tickets, just being like, nobody here is going to know who Tyler Childers is. I'll, I'll just get tickets like the day of, and it sold out, <laughs> like almost immediately sold out. Yeah. And that, and I just didn't realize it because sometimes I, I like we have this, I have this skewed idea of who's big and who's not in terms of ticket sales and record sales and that kind of thing, because there are some artists that I'm just completely obsessed with that, like, I think are huge that nobody knows. Right. And then yeah. there's like, and then it's just, that scale is so weird, you know, like yeah, it's, it's hard to, to keep up with, um, you know, who's, who's selling 15,000 <laughs> seats and who is it? Yeah. This, this guy came up to me in Walmart the other day and was like, it's like, man, I bet it's getting to where you can't go out in public anymore. And it's like, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> like, so yeah, just if you, you can be really into somebody, you know, and just be like, Oh, they must get bothered all the time. It's like, no, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> there's, a, there's no danger of me being recognized in most places, you know? Yeah. Uh, that's funny. Charles Wesley Godwin was on just a few months ago and uh, he told me he, he can pretty much go anywhere and people don't recognize him, which kind of surprised me. I, I thought like I, he's at the point where it'd be tough for him to go to Walmart, but again, scale, yeah. like, I don't fucking know. I, you know, it's uh-huh. just, it happens so fast seemingly too. Like, Cause yeah, I mean, I followed Charles on Instagram like a few years ago and he was just like, just a guy sitting in his bedroom making cell phone videos, you know? And I was like, but he had, I mean, he still had an incredible voice, but I mean, like this video has got like 300, 400 views or something. And then like you yeah. turn around and it's like, this guy's a superstar. How did, yeah. yeah. When did that wild. happen? I blinked 
you know, I felt like, uh, I'm sure they don't feel like it was like that at all. Yeah. Cause I, cause I've been going through this whole album prep thing and it is not for the faint of heart. <laughs> well, man, the album's incredible. And, um, I'm excited for folks to get their ears on it. I'm really looking forward to, to getting to hear people, you know, see the conversations online about it and engage with people about it. Cause I think it's an absolutely brilliant record and um, I, I'm really glad we connected. I, I'm I'm super grateful for your time and flexibility. And uh, just thank you so much. Hey, thank you, man. I really appreciate all your kind words and taking your time to meet with me. Truly my pleasure, man. All right. Well, have a great night. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Take care, Jason. See you. Zach Russell, everyone. Thank you so much, Zach. Thank all of you for listening. ZachRussellMusic.com for all things Zach. Give him a follow on socials. Get a physical copy of Where the Flowers Meet the Dew. It is outstanding, y'all. The song you're hearing in this episode is Born Again, which you heard us dive into during the conversation. MarinadePodcast.com for all things The Marinade. Follow us everywhere. We're pretty much everywhere on social media except for Facebook. If y'all want us to get back on Facebook, I did that. I got off there years ago. Uh, I just got pissed because they were su- supporting misinformation. And I guess everybody's doing that now. Um, and I guess have been, but it just felt different then, right? Especially after the 2016 election leading up to the 2020 election. I was like, man, I don't want to fucking be a part of all this. Uh, but, you know, now Twitter is just as bad if not worse so we'll get back on there if you want us to i just don't miss it and don't care to fool with it but if it would be helpful for you if we were on facebook let us know subscribe and give us a five star rating on your podcast app tell a friend about the show these are all free ways to support the marinade go do that right now while you're listening please it makes a big difference for us and costs so little of your time and energy. If you really like what we're doing, please consider joining our Patreon community. Just two bucks a month, y'all. You can gain access to Patreon-exclusive content like our show, Jason's Journey, where I talk about the moments that shape my creative life and provide a window into the process of making the marinade. One of the best days of the month for me is recording what we're getting down on with my dear friend, the brilliant and hilarious Peter Haroldson. We talk about the art that has us fired up at the moment. It's an absolute blast. Y'all, you can now try a free trial of Patreon. See if you like it. No pressure. Try it for seven days. Set a reminder on your phone in case you want to cancel, but keep going if you dig it. It's only two bucks a month. And if you can do more than that, we greatly appreciate it. If you want to support the show financially, but you don't want to commit to a monthly subscription, I completely get that. You can Venmo or PayPal us. It's just at the marinade. All the money goes right back into the making of the show. We're planning a trip to Orange Blossom Review. It's more than planned. We're on our way this weekend. Jen Ross, the wonderful photographer and friend and collaborator of mine, are headed to Orange Blossom Review. And we have some cool stuff lined up, y'all. I'm really, really looking forward to it. We also have our eyes on some events in the new year and, uh, you know, it's, it's coming up fast. I mean, we're already basically in December as I'm recording this. So if you can swing it, we'd greatly appreciate it. But above all, we're thankful that you listen and spread the word about the marinade until next time. Go out and create something. Cheers. y'all.